Hi, everyone. My name is Jessie Tannenbaum. I'm with the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. I'm so sorry I can't be with you in person today, but I want to congratulate all members of the bar on the first ever bar conference. And I'm honored that I've been invited to speak today about a proposal that ABA Rowley has been working on with the Bar Council to develop a continuing professional development regime for the Maldivian legal profession. My presentation today is going to start with a quick introduction and overview of continuing professional development. Um, I'll then be giving you an overview of good practices in other jurisdictions and recommendations that we make for the new CPD regime in Maldives based on those good practices. And then finally, we're going to break into some breakout groups to discuss CPD regime components. There will be many questions outstanding. Even with the recommendations, there's a lot of questions and issues that need to be decided by members of the bar. And the breakout groups will be a key step in making those decisions to finalize development of the system. The objectives for today's session first is for all of you to understand why CPD is necessary and to become familiar with basics of a CPD regime. Second, to understand good practices and how these can or should be adapted in the Maldivian context. And third, for the lawyers and the members of the bar to become active participants in the develop of the C development of the CPD regime, to respond to outstanding questions and to make recommendations for the regime, which all of you will be taking part in. Um, so first, an introduction and the basics of CPD. The purpose of CPD, just like the purpose of any regulation on lawyers, is to protect the public by ensuring that lawyers meet the highest standard for knowledge, skills, and professionalism. So what are some considerations for a new CPD regime? You know, fundamentally, what are the questions that, you know, we should all ask ourselves when we're thinking about how to develop a system for CPD? First, what are the essential knowledge, skills, and professional qualities that all lawyers should maintain after they've gained admission to the profession? Second, how can the legal profession regulator make sure that the lawyers maintain these skills, knowledge, and professional qualities? Um, what knowledge, skills, or professional qualities should be required of all lawyers, and what should be based on specialization only? And finally, how can the bar help lawyers meet these requirements without an undue burden on their practice? Any system of CPD is going to have about six components. Um, I've broken them down into six components. Um, the first are the CPD takers. Who has to take CPD? Second, the CPD content. On what topics do you have to take CPD and in what format? The CPD requirements. How much CPD do you have to take and when do you have to take it? CPD providers. Who can offer CPD? CPD reporting. How do you get your credit for the CPD and how is it tracked? And finally, CPD compli compliance. What happens if you don't take the required CPD? I apologize for the cat in the blurred background. I did my best to avoid this, but it was inevitable. Um, next, I'm gonna to move to an overview of CPD good practices, um, looking at the six components that I just mentioned. Um, first, what are the jurisdictions that I looked at to develop these good practices, these summaries of good practices? Um, first, I looked at standards from Canada, specifically British Columbia, the United States, specifically Illinois, um, Ireland, the standards for solicitors from the Solicitors Licensing Authority, the UK, the standards for barristers, Australia in New South Wales, Singapore, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Um, these were selected because they represent common practices in CPD, uh, because they're seen as innovative leaders um, in components of CPD, or because they have contextual similarities to Maldives. Um, so all of the jurisdictions represented one or more of you know, those three, three qualities, and that's why I chose them. I also considered the ABA's model rules um, for continuing legal education. The ABA develops model rules, model standards for a number of professional um, development or professional standards, um, including ethics, um, legal education, and continuing professional development, or what we call continuing legal education in the U.S., um, and so I also looked at those model standards um, and considered them in drawing good practices. So first, who has to take CPD? Generally, there will be two categories of people who take CPD. The first are new lawyers, and the second are experienced lawyers. Different jurisdictions define these two differently. Um, most jurisdictions will define new lawyers as lawyers in their first year of practice. Um, but some jurisdictions, particularly the UK, um, defines new, new barristers as barristers who are within their first three years after the year when they become licensed, so really their first four years of practice. 
Um, experienced lawyers usually are defined as lawyers with more than one year of experience. Um, and both experienced and new lawyers will have some mandatory courses. Um, while experienced lawyers will also have the chance to take self-chosen courses, um, which would mean, you know, topics that are more relevant to their practice, to their area of specialization. Um, additionally, many bars around the world have an inactive status that lawyers can take if they're not practicing, um, or a judicial status that lawyers can take if they're appointed to become judges, um, lawyers who are in academic roles or, you know, who are taking leave from the work from their work to, to take care of their family, those kind of those kind of issues might cause a lawyer to go on an active status. Um, and most jurisdictions also offer exemptions for those lawyers from CPD, but then if those lawyers do go back to regular practice, they have to catch up on their required courses. So those are the two or kind of two and a half categories of people who take CPD. Um, what topics should CPD cover? Um, again, I mentioned that there are usually both mandatory and self-chosen courses. Um, for new lawyers, pretty universally, new lawyers have to take an ethics course and some sort of basic lawyering skills course. Um, the ethics course will generally be fairly lengthy compared to an ethics course that will be required for experienced lawyers every year and will give new lawyers sort of a broad introduction to the professional standards, the professional responsibility standards in their jurisdiction. Um, obviously, they'll have passed the bar exam. Um, they'll have completed, you know, their one-year traineeship under the current LPA, um, but they may still have basic skills that need to be taught as well. Um, one of the questions that, you know, I'm going to ask you to consider during the breakout groups is whether new lawyers who do complete a one-year traineeship, whether that traineeship should be sufficient to substitute for taking CPD on basic skills, or whether there are other basic lawyering skills that still should be taught through CPD. Um, experienced lawyers um, also pretty universally have to take an ethics course during every reporting cycle for CPD. Um, in addition, um, the ABA recommends, and there is a trend, towards requiring experienced lawyers to take um, a course on mental health or wellness um, or a substance abuse disorder, a similar topic. And I wanted to, to single that out and mention why that should be required. Um, I think, as we all know, there is a high level of, of stress and, and mental health challenges and wellness cha challenges in the legal profession. And there can be a very high stigma um, associated with admitting to struggling with your mental health. Um, by requiring a mental health or wellness credit, this provides an opportunity for lawyers to engage in you know, wellness activities and to get support without having any stigma associated with it because every lawyer has to take the wellness credit. Um, so it's it's something to consider, it's a good practice and it's you know increasingly used in, in jurisdictions around the world. Um, and it also you know helps lawyers who may not even realize that they need that type of support, um, but they'll receive it anyway if they're required to, to take that course. Um, in addition, there are self-chosen courses. Usually new lawyers don't have the opportunity or don't have a requirement to take credits that would include self-chosen courses, whereas experienced lawyers will normally be able to take, you know, at least 50% of their CPD on self-chosen courses. Um, these could be courses that um, are specific to practice management, their particular type of practice, for instance, practice management for solo practitioners, um, you know, courses such as managing escrow accounts, um, other things that are more on the business side of things, or there could be courses that are on their substantive area of law, you know, criminal procedure, trust and estates, property. Um, and these essentially allow experienced lawyers to focus on their specific areas of need for CPD. Um, it's a good practice. It's recommended that, you know, at least 50% of credits be available for lawyers to specialize um, and choose their own courses. Um, meaning if lawyers were required to take, say, 10 hours per year, at least five hours per year should be for self-chosen courses. Some jurisdictions also have subject matter requirements that only um, apply to certain types of lawyers. Um, for instance, Ireland requires solicitors that deal with um, anti-money laundering to take specific courses on anti-money laundering compliance, while other lawyers are not required to, to take those courses. So that's another consideration. Um, CPD also often includes required catch-up courses for lawyers who are returning from non-practice. Um, so lawyers who have been on inactive status for a certain duration of time um, and what that duration of time should be is, is something that needs to be determined, um, would have to um, take a course 
that, um, you know, would make sure that they have maintained the skills that they had when they went on inactive status, essentially, and that they're also up to date on any changes in the law that may have occurred during inactive status. Um, so how much CPD um, should lawyers have to take and when? Um, for new lawyers, usually only the mandatory courses are required. Usually new lawyers are required, you know, to take, for instance, three to four hours of ethics and, you know, maybe four to six hours of basic skills, and that would be it for their first year. Um, and they're not required to take additional credits on a topic of their choosing. Um, experienced lawyers, you know, generally most jurisdictions require somewhere in the area of 10 to 12 hours per year. Um, and as I mentioned before, the best practice is to allow most of those credits to be self-chosen. Um, also, some jurisdictions have moved to an outcomes-focused system um, where instead of having to take another, a, a certain set of, sorry, a certain number of points, um, lawyers have to instead achieve certain goals or outcomes for, for their learning. Um, I'm not actually recommending that for the Maldives at this time, you know, establishing a brand new CPD system, sticking to the traditional format um, will be much easier transition for lawyers who've never had to take CPD before and also much easier to set up um, on the secretariat side and, you know, for the providers um, as well. Um, so, you know, at least for a new system, this traditional point system where lawyers have to take a certain number of hours per year and, you know, are able to choose their courses will, will be, you know, would be my recommendation, the ABA's recommendation for the new system. Excuse me. Um, so who can offer CPD? I mentioned providers. Um, so every jurisdiction accredits outside providers to offer CPD. Um, outside providers might be things like law schools, um, you know, legal institutions, um, you know, uh, what we might call specialized bar associations. So for instance, I don't think these are present in Maldives at the moment, but for instance, a specialized bar association for criminal defense lawyers might offer CPD on criminal defense um, or criminal procedure or criminal code reform. Um, whereas um, other providers might want to get accredited just to offer certain courses. Um, for instance, if there's a big conference happening and there's going to be one session in that conference that is you know, about constitutional reform, for example, that provider, um, even though they're not a traditional legal institute, might want to ask um, for lawyers to be able to receive accreditation because that will entice more lawyers to sign up for the conference. Um, one question you know, to consider is whether BCM wants to accredit every course that's going to be offered or whether there are certain types of institutions such as law schools um, or legal institutes where they may wanna offer blanket accreditation and you know, renew that blanket accreditation on some sort of regular or semi-regular basis. Um, and, you know, there could be advantages to both. Certainly offering a blanket accreditation um, could, you know, minimize the administrative burden on the bar. On the other hand, that means that they're not approving the content of every single course that that provider offers. Um, the bar itself also often offers CPD and particularly for the mandatory courses. And in fact, in, in many places, the bar maintains a monopoly on offering those mandatory courses so that you can only take your mandatory courses from the bar. And the reason for that is to ensure consistency of standards um, and consistency of content is being taught, especially for the courses for new lawyers. Um, bars generally want to be assured that all lawyers have learned the same content and demonstrated the same knowledge. Um, and so, you know, in, in many cases, and my recommendation would be that the bar, um, that the bar council maintain a monopoly on those required courses, especially for new lawyers. Um, another issue that often comes up is non-accredited providers. And, and the reason Illinois was one of the jurisdictions I considered is because Illinois has a relatively innovative approach to this. Um, you know, many lawyers, particularly in Maldives, um, you know, may want to attend conferences that are outside the country. They may be traveling for business and, and, you know, undertake some educational activities while they're traveling. And because they've spent that time, you know, in their professional development, they want to receive credit for it. Um, and so in Illinois, they have a system where lawyers can essentially submit a course that they've already attended or that they're planning to attend that was not accredited, that was, you know, at an international conference or something like that, and, you know, request credit for it on an individual basis. And if the bar finds that it met the standards, um, established for accreditation for that course, and they'll award the credit to the lawyer. And the reason for having a system where individual lawyers can request credit is because 
um, you know, major international conferences are unlikely to institutionally request credit for from the Maldives bar for a very small number of lawyers who might attend. And, you know, it's it's much easier um, and, and better for the Maldivian lawyers if they're able to request that themselves rather than have to kind of beg and hurrying the, the organizers to request the credit. Um, so I have recommended that the bar adopt that. Um, finally, in-house continuing professional development. This would be courses offered by, for instance, a law firm or a government agency um, or another organization only for the lawyers that, you know, work there. Um, and the ABA recommends that in-house continuing professional development essentially be accredited just like any other CPD provider um, would be accredited so that um, employers are able to offer CPD specifically for their own employees, so long as it meets the standards that have been established for CPD accreditation. Um, so how would CPD credits and reporting work? Um, most jurisdictions use a really simple system. They have different names, um, but generally one hour of a course or teaching one hour of a CPD course will count for one credit. Um, some jurisdictions just count it in hours, others count it in points, but generally a point or a credit is the same as an hour. Um, and, you know, the, the most, you know, standard way of, of taking CPD is to take some sort of training course, workshop, lecture, something like that, something that would be called a, a course. Um, some jurisdictions do allow non-course activities to count. Um, this is, you know, something that is much more difficult to establish and track, and especially in a newly established CPD system, um, you know, it would be extremely complicated both to establish the system for it and, you know, challenging for members to navigate how to get credit and how exactly to count those activities. Um, some jurisdictions, for instance, allow um, time spent writing, you know, major law journal articles. Um, other jurisdictions um, allow um, time spent um, in postgraduate study um, or similar activities like that. Um, and I've recommended that the DCM at least initially focus on establishing a traditional system that focuses on courses. And once the system is established, then consider expansion, um, you know, to um, non-course activities as well. And how are those CPD credits reported or, or kept track of? Uh, usually they're tied to license renewal. Um, most jurisdictions have an annual bar year, a license cycle where um, lawyers have to renew their, their law licenses every year. Um, and most jurisdictions simply tie CPD reporting to that renewal schedule. It's, it's the simplest way to keep track um, of when CPD reporting is due. Um, it can create more of a burden on the staff of the bar that have to, um, you know, keep track of the reporting because they're renewing law licenses at the same time that they're verifying that people have completed their CPD, but it's, it's certainly easier on the lawyers. Some jurisdictions do have different reporting cycles and bar years. They might require lawyers to renew their license every year, but the reporting cycle for um, CPD is two years so that half the lawyers have to you know, report their CPD compliance in even numbered years and half the lawyers report their CPD compliance in odd numbered years, usually based either on last name or on the year that they were admitted. Um, but the one of the, you know, things to consider in, um, you know, in, in developing the reporting and schedule is to, we want to create something that would minimize the burden on the secretariat because this will keep costs down. CPD is largely going to be paid for by the providers who pay fees to become accredited. But providers will, of course, often pass those costs on down to the lawyers who take the courses. And so the more that the cost of accrediting a course can be minimized, then, you know, the less, ideally, those, those courses should cost. So in thinking about how to design a system that would minimize the administrative burden um, and also be easy for lawyers, the, the easiest system is to have the providers actually report who's completed CPD. Those reports are filed, you know, to the, the BCM secretariat after completion of the course, and they provide a list of the lawyers and how many credits, and that's simply entered into a database. Um, and, um, and then lawyers, you know, can verify that, or if they feel they were left off a list, can appeal that, but it doesn't require any proactive activity um, on the part of the lawyers, and it also allows the secretariat to receive those CPD reports on a, on a rolling basis instead of all at once at the end of the year. So that's the system I've recommended. Finally, what happens for non-compliance? Um, what if you don't complete your CPD? Um, 
pretty much every jurisdiction will suspend the licenses of lawyers who don't comply with CPD requirements. And, and it makes sense if the purpose of CPD you know, is to ensure the protection of the public, that, that the lawyers who are out there representing people in the courts um, or you know, before the legal system providing legal advice know what they're doing and, and are up to date on legal developments. Um, then it, it makes sense that you shouldn't be allowed to practice if you haven't, you know, been able to demonstrate that you have stayed up to date on the law and any legal developments. Most jurisdictions, um, some jurisdictions anyway, do allow a grace period. I think particularly for a new CPD system, um, allowing a grace period will be helpful, um, you know, to let lawyers, you know, get familiar with the idea of having to report CPD annually and, you know, to make sure that everything is reported on time. Usually lawyers might have 30 days to come into compliance. And of course, any CPD taken during those 30 days would only count towards the prior year for which they weren't compliant. They'd also have to take the CPD for the new year. Um, the other question is, you know, should there be exemptions to um, required CPD? Um, as I mentioned, pretty much every jurisdiction has a way for lawyers to become inactive or non-practicing. And during that time, they don't have to complete CPD because they're not practicing law. Um, but the other question is, you know, should there be other exemptions? Um, some jurisdictions reduce the requirements for very senior attorneys or, you know, attorneys over a certain age. I actually advise against this. Um, it's not considered a good practice because actually more experienced lawyers can be less up to date on legal changes and new legal developments um, and new technologies and things like that. Um, so you know, the recommendation is to have the same number of credits required and the same basic requirements for all um, experienced lawyers. Um, but there may be other situations such as emergency situations, you know, family responsibilities um, where, um, you know, lawyers may need an exemption and a system should be, you know, set up to provide some consideration to those lawyers and, you know, give them maybe not a full waiver, but an extension to complete CPD for the prior year without having their license suspended. Um, and so that's another question that we breakout groups will be, will be considering. Um, so that was the review of the good practices. Um, we will be breaking into breakout groups. I say we, but I'm obviously not joining you. You will be breaking into breakout groups. Um, and this, you know, the purpose of the breakout groups is to give you an opportunity to weigh in um, and provide your input on the recommendations and, and share your um, opinions and ideas with the leadership of the bar, with the secretariat, um, so that everyone will, will have um, the opportunity to, to be considered, um, have their opinions considered. And the breakouts will come in six groups. Um, and these will include um, groups on CPD content for new lawyers, for experienced lawyers, um, CPD providers, the credit system, um, reporting and compliance and exemptions. You're all going to be given a handout that has a summary of the good practices done in other jurisdictions, as well as the, the recommendations that have been developed by um, ABA Rowley. And you'll have the opportunity to review those. There are questions for discussion. Um, and also um, there are um, opportunities to, to bring up other recommendations or ask other questions. Um, if you really want to dig in deep and you know have more information on any of these topics, um, I do have a full research memo available. I'm happy to share it, um, or you know the secretariat can share it, um, and then you can actually go to the original sources and see for yourself specifically what different jurisdictions are doing. Um, so we're going to move to breakout groups now. Um, you know, please um, follow the secretariat staff who will show you where to go, and then you'll reconvene and report back for a group discussion. Um, with your recommendations on each of the breakout areas. Um, thank you so much. Um, here's my email address. If anyone wants to contact me um, with any follow-up questions, I'm happy to talk. You can also, of course, always speak to my colleague, Mada, um, who's at the conference. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Bye. Thank you, Jesse. Um,